I think the title of today's class is Spiders, Slugs, and Worms. Oh my. Uh, and it also says, and other cool non-insect invertebrates. So um, when we're talking about invertebrates, what are we, what are we talking about? Is that a, a real taxonomic category? Kind of. Um, it's basically a, a general term for anything that doesn't have a backbone. So it's not really a formal category. It's for like all those things. And I'll show you sort of how that fits in. But one of the things that um, when we do this class, we like to sort of talk about, well, before we get started with that, um, I'm just going to actually have you look at all of this. And what do you think? What, what is that? Sylvia. Mm -hmm. Right here. This thing. A silk is that the top of a, a one of those um, spiders, turret spider, oh. the top of the top of a. Oh. It could be, but no. Snail <laughs> <laughs> dart. Century Now those are actually the median spinnerets on a spider. Oh. So all those little oh. tiny things wow. are nozzles. And that's what the silk comes out of. And that's just like the middle part. There's like around there. And I'll show you it in context. But I kind of like, you know, sort of looking at this. What about this right here? A foot. A little bit in a claw. Yeah, so this is a spider leg. See all those hairs and see those fringes? That play a really important role. And if you think about those spider webs and how there's webs and there's all this sticky stuff on it, how come the spider doesn't get stuck in its own web? How can it run around in it? And the construction of its feet has something to do with that. What about this? Right here, this one. It is, it's the mouth of a tick. <laughs> so everybody in the back, what do you do when somebody goes, ew? <laughs> Obi-Wan has taught you well. <laughs> so one of the things I like to say is that you really are like ambassadors of ooh and ambassadors of ugh. And any time that you can get kids to go from ew to how interesting is really amazing. And one of the things that I really think, you know, I think about a lot is, you know, all of this work that they've done where they've shown how much we learn by using our mirror neurons, how we see somebody smile and we smile. Um, and they've, they've looked at, they've actually this is a really interesting study that um, looked at, it was done in Germany, and it looked at people that were getting their degrees in nature education teaching, you know, teaching outdoor education, teaching environmental education. Um, and so they learned all the pedagogy, but they didn't really actually learn the connection and they did studies of the people after they had spent time working with all the kids, and the kids didn't have the nature connection, and the people didn't have the nature connection. So studying all of this stuff about how to actually, you know, say things this way and do these games or whatever is all great, but it doesn't really work unless you have that nature connection. And, and they showed even more that the prejudices of the people who were teaching were passed on to the students that they were teaching. So when you sit there and you see a spider and say, let's kill it, like my coworkers did, that would get passed on to the kids. I mean, that fear. So what we try to do is like figure out what is exciting about this stuff and what is cool about this stuff and how it fits in with everything so that that's what we're passing on to the kids. And I have a homework assignment for you at the end of the day to do a little bit of that. What about this? What's this right here? <coughs> Eye. 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 Tongue. Eye. Like flies. Well, no. Snail. Snail tongue. Snail tongue. Gradual. That is. Snails have like this way of feeding where, you know, they're not officially teeth like our teeth, but um, they have more teeth than anything else on the so when Are those teeth? Well, they're not like teeth like our teeth, but they're they're like a rasper. So they're like like a three-year cheese in the and I'll show you. What about these? That's just a head of a pin. Oh my god. Those are earthworm eggs. Earthworm eggs. Exactly. Earthworm And what about this? Earthworm side. Actually, earthworm side. Right. Those are, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And this is kind of obvious, huh? Yeah. Spider. Spider face. And how about this? Web. 
Yeah, it's a little bit of silk, and it's a special kind of silk. A little bit about that one. And what about this right here? Baby scorpions. Baby scorpions. Baby scorpions. I know. I always know Richard. Pretty much guarantee scorpions. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got through the first slide. <laughs> one of the things that I think is important to talk about. How many people, when they first went to school, learned that there were two kingdoms, plants and animals? Yeah. <laughs> then, as things progressed, by the time I got to college, it was like, oh, there's not two kingdoms, there's five kingdoms. There's plants, animals, fungi, protoctista, which is this great junk category for everything that we didn't really understand, but it's small that we can throw in there, and then monera, and that's basically all the bacteria and stuff. So how many people grew up with five kingdoms? Um, and wow. what is it now? Who oh, no. knows? What are kids using learning now? It's amazing all the stuff we're learning. So we've gone from five kingdoms to basically three domains, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. So instead of this like tree of life, it's now actually this kind of fan of life. And if you look at it, I mean, one of the things that I think is really cool, and you know, we're learning more and more all the time with genetics is this whole thing, this whole thing that's called, this domain that's called archaea. Do people know what that is? What's in there? Are yeah? You, um, archaea is like real tiny bacteria life organisms that live in very extreme conditions. Yeah, they are extremophiles, they call. Yeah. Um, and actually, we're finding a lot more of them that don't actually need the extreme conditions either, the more that we find out. So it's kind of cool. So we have these bacteria, we have these bacteria-like things that a lot of the ones we first discovered lived in things like the thermal vents in Yellowstone and stuff like that. And then we have everything else um, called the eukarya. Do people know what eukaryotes are? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, multicellular and has nucleus in the, in the cells. It has a yeah nucleus and and yeah. So basically has like a, a cell wall around it. nucleus too. Yeah. And if you look there, what's there? The thing that's interesting is if you look at it, you know, here animals are like we split off from these like weird things that live in extreme environments um, after the split was already made to the bacteria. But look up here, here's animals, here's fungi, here's plants, here's diatoms. Those are the things that we're the closest related to on this fan. Like that's pretty amazing. You know, when you think about how not that long ago we sort of thought, well, fungi are sort of these weird kind of plant things. And now, you know, we're a lot more closely related to fungi than fungi are related to our lettuce and our salad. Um, more closely. Anyway, so I just wanted to mention this because this is what folks are learning. Now. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a time aspect in this fan here that um, we think that these things um, evolved at? at sort yeah, of and that's what these branches are. And so when they go down, that's just the way. Of, uh, that's just the way the thing is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Here, the thing that, you know, used to be called plants and used to be called animals and used to be called fungi, here are three of those old kingdoms. These are all kingdoms now, and there's actually more of them. So kingdoms, you know, there's a kingdom of the like red algae and a kingdom that radiolarians belong to and green algae belongs to and, you know, slime molds. Um, and here's animals. So I'm just trying to go out and then drill into what we're looking at today. And it, it sort of plays into when, you know, Julia and Richard talk about insects and, you know, just kind of set the stage a little. So here, if you take a very simplified um, <coughs> map of the animal kingdom, you know, that includes things like sponges and flatworms and, and earthworms and arthropods and sea stars and sea urchins. And here's the chordata. Here's the little group that has backbones. So when we're talking about invertebrates, we're talking about everything else in this kingdom um, except for that little group that has backbones. To just sort of put it in perspective. It is. And this... 
I did this a couple of years ago. This is a, an Excel you know, thing that I did just when I got the most recent um, listing of how many, the numbers of species on the planet. So a lot of things are showing 0% because they're like 0.02% of the number of species. If you look at it, this section that has the most number of species is beetles. Here is the ants and the wasps. Here's the butterflies and moths. Here's the flies. Here's the sort of true bugs. Here are mollusks. Here are all the arachnids. Here's the mammals. <laughs> and when you think about total biomass, the next slide is a little blurry, but you know that's just the number of species. But when you think about the biomass of everything, by far the greatest biomass in terms of animals on the planet is the things in the soil fauna, excluding the large earthworms, ants, and termites. Here is ants and termites. And here's the large earthworms, oligotes. So between this, this, and this, it's pretty much most of the biomass on the planet. Here's all the other insects. Here, like the mammals are a little bit bigger than a little tiny slice in terms of the number of species, but part of that is because, you know, we have things like blue whales and stuff, which, you know, are kind of hefty. So I like this because, I don't know, um, I realize I've been really attracted to little things ever since I was little. I mean, one of my favorite books when I was growing up um, was Horton Hears a Who. <laughs> People remember that one? Yeah. On the 15th of May in the jungle of Noon, in the heat of the day, in the cool of the pool, he was splashing and joy. I could do the whole thing because my brother, who's seven years younger, liked it so much. I read it to him so often. I don't um, but that whole, that whole book is about, you know, the fact that here's this elephant that finds this clover and there's an entire planet going on on the little piece of clover. And that's sort of what I think about when I am out there walking, and it's also what I think about when I think about my body. I mean, we talked about this before, but you know, we have way more things in us that aren't us than are us. <laughs> so we're these little walking ecosystems of you know, whole communities. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about <coughs> um, spiders and other non-insect arthropods. We're going to talk about slugs um, and snails in the phylum <coughs> Mollusca, and we're going to talk about earthworms and some other stuff. So, here we go. So these are all arthropods. What makes an arthropod an arthropod? People remember that from an old zoology class. What are the characteristics of something that's an arthropod? All of these are arthropods. Is a shell? Exoskeleton. Well, it has a yeah, chitinous exoskeleton. Yes. Jointed limbs. Paired jointed appendages. Yes. It, it metamorphos. It has the metamorphous. Uh, doesn't it go through different stages? But I don't know if that's true. Well, different okay. ones do. Okay. Um, but. One thing, if you had took your skeleton and put it on the outside, what do you need to do to grow? Yeah. So they're all molten. They all molt in some form or another. Yep. Yep, they have to do that. I mean, once a, once a barnacle actually attaches itself to a substrate, you know, it'll kind of grow and add more calcium and it doesn't. Well, actually, the little critters, never mind. <laughs> So, when we look at the domain, kingdom, phylum, do people, did people have a, you know, when, what are those called when you have something so you remember something? Uh, mnemonic, 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 mnemonic device. Do people have a mnemonic device for the kingdom, phylum, class, order, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kingdom species? Yeah. What? Uh, kings play chess on fine green sand. <laughs> kings play, anybody else have another one? King. King Philip did something. Julia? Um, for botany, it was kind deeds can offset foul, grievous sins. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I used to, when I taught parasitology and stuff like that, I would have as one of my extra credit class, 
pieces, I would have um, folks come up with their own. The one that I came up with was Kinky Parasitologist Climax Over Fervid Gregorines. <laughs> <laughs> If you ever went to class in Paris, I can explain that, I know. <laughs> so, um, we're going to talk about arachnids today, and here are some of the non-spider arachnids. What's this right here? What is that? Give us a hint. If I give you a hint, this is an eyebrow hair. Oh my goodness. Oh, how interesting. These are little eyebrow mites. And pretty much everybody over the age of 30 has them. When I used to teach parasitology labs, how interesting. I need to be closed off. Yeah. I would make my students squeeze their eyebrows and we put them on slides and look at them under high powered microscopes. And we would do, you know, because I had a lot of younger students because I was teaching in a, um, at, when I was teaching at UCSB. And we'd graph how many people actually had the apple. <laughs> so see, you are walking around with some of these, like, yeah? So if they're that tiny, how does one get them? How do you get them if they're that tiny? Well, you know, I mean, I, who knows? Mites are actually amazing creatures in terms of employing something we call foracy, which means they hitch a ride on things. Um, if you look at bearing beetles, a lot of them have like mites all over them. Or there's that whole thing about hummingbirds. Do you know about the hummingbirds and their nostril mites? <laughs> so there are mites in the nostrils of hummingbirds that get from flower to flower by running up the flower into the nostrils of the hummingbirds and hitching a ride to the next flower and having to run down the hummingbird, find another mite to mate with, and then so they're, they're doing that all over the place. And they say that you know the speed with which they have to and the size of them. Are so small, the speed with which they have to get to the nostril, they're sort of like cheetahs. You know, they're like fast in terms of that. So, who knows? I mean, think about the house. Your house is just piled, I mean, with dust mites. I mean, you don't see them, but if it wasn't, you know, there would be piles of dead skin all over the place, right? Ew. Oh, <laughs> housekeeper when I get So, yeah. We're not really going to talk much about pseudoscorpions, but um, if we ever have a leaf litter day where we collect leaf litter and stuff, we can find pseudoscorpions and that. That's really cool. Talk a little bit about ticks. I think you already did a little bit in the cool relationship between the lizards mm -hmm. and ticks. Um, remember, didn't we find an Opaleone daddy long leg down at the creek? A weird little thing that looks like it has one body part and has these weird sort of joints on their legs. And you want to see me get excited, come to me. Come with me to the tide pools sometimes. There's a certain tide pools where on the giant green anemones, if you look underneath their tentacles, you can find these really weird creatures called sea spiders. Um, and then the scorpions. So we've talked about this. Um, yeah, and that it has to remain attached for several hours to a day in order for the live disease to transfer. And tell me about that association with the western fence lizard that you've all learned about. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. is it? it attaches. Yeah. Right. Cool. Yeah. Here's that mouth part. And just to sort of, you know, here's the black legged tick, which is the smallest one that we usually find. Um, oops. And the. This is the other more common one that I have a tendency to find. I don't really see the little star tick that much around here. Scorpion. Um, I love the fact that they carry their babies on their back like a lot of other arachnids. Uh, anything else you know about scorpions? They have venom. They have venom. I suppose, yeah. A lot of arachnids do. What, what do the babies eat? Do the mother eat them when she sees them? That's a good question. I'm not sure. Do you know, Richard, what the babies eat? Mm -hmm. No, I know they stay on the back and for a while. Yeah. But I mean, they, they, they could be just or she'll eat them. not really. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's the same thing like with wolf spiders and stuff too. So you know, I'm not sure if they have enough. Um, 
whatever from when they were in the egg to survive that, that first molt. Um, some instances we know um, what's going on is what we kind of call sibling yolk, where a few of them eat a few of them. But, you know, a little aside, scorpion uh, courtship is pretty amazing. Like, they actually, the male will get the pincers of the female and sort of dance they around dance with around. her. And then after, it can last up to several hours, actually, and when he senses that she's finally in the mood, he'll deposit a little sperm packet, and she'll, like, move over and take the sperm packet up, and that's how her eggs get fertilized. Mm -hmm. I had a professor once who used to start every lecture, it was a parasitology professor, with this some random story that, you know, you'd have to sit, you'd be sitting there the whole lecture trying to figure out, like, how did that story fit into what we're learning today? And I remember that one class he's talked about, you know, like these two folks in a bar and they were talking and they met and then they were dancing and then she went back to the table and she sat in something wet and, you know, like, what's going on? And finally we got to the part of the lecture where he was talking about scorpion and it was like, oh, okay. Yes. How you remember that? Exactly. That's, there you go. You know, that's why you do it. Uh-huh. <laughs> so here's like the full picture of that little follicle mite that's in your eyebrows. Um, here's what a dust mite looks like under high, high magnification. How many people have seen these red velvet mites when they're out in the desert or hiking around and stuff? Really the cutest things. Um, I had this really good friend who, um, her family was very, very Italian, and I used to be so impressed when I went over to her house that I, when I went to the bathroom, the whole thing was wallpapered in red velvet. <laughs> the first time I saw one of these mites, I was like, oh, I have to take that to Laura's mom. <laughs> um, chigger mites, how many people have had chigger mites? Yeah. Yeah. Here's the whole, um, here's an actual hummingbird feeder. So those are all of the hummingbird, that was from a pic, the paper, one of the papers that was studying all of the little mites that jump off of the hummingbirds. Here's some mites that are hitching a ride on a uh, dragonfly. Here's mites that are actually on a moth's ear. And this is a burying beetle, those cool little beetles that actually, you know, will bury the carcass, they'll dig a hole under it and lay their eggs in it, create this whole chamber. Well, there's all of these mites that hitch a ride on these burying beetles, and what's really cool is the, mite, the carrion beetle gets to the carrion, it can like sense it, um, smell it, it has these really great antenna that are there for picking up odors. The mites all jump off, and what is the first thing that usually you see come to something dead, to a carrion? Flies. So the flies lay their eggs in the carrion, and those legs will actually hatch into the larvae. And, well, these little um, mites jump off and actually eat the fly eggs. <coughs> so there's like this sort of beneficial relationship um, with the beetle and the mite and the dead thing. I like this too. This is actually a picture from a study that we did at the Martin Griffin Preserve where we were looking at different treatments um, to try and get rid of this nasty invasive grass. And we did soil samples, you know. So we took, we would take a sample that was about this big in the middle of each plot. And then I had this great group of volunteers that for months would sit in my lab breathing denatured alcohol fumes <laughs> and sort through all of them. And in each one of those little samples, it was very easy to get between 1,000 and 2,000 critters. And we were only going down like an inch and a half. So this is just pictures of a partial one of those samples in alcohol. You can see little mites and you can see beetles and springtails and all of that stuff. Um, and it's just a good reminder that what we're walking on is filled it's, it's alive. with the live. Yeah, there's another picture of one of the samples. Did these things survive the fire? 
Um, I think that a lot of them might. You know, it depends. I mean, when, you know, we've talked with Sasha and stuff, the, the, it didn't get super hot very deep. Um, I know that, you know, having gone through the Point Reyes fire, folks were worried about that. They were worried about the mycorrhizal associations, like the fungus. They thought that maybe it burnt so hot that that would have been destroyed. And it's been really interesting watching this, those studies and how, in fact, um, they weren't. So, but it would be interesting, actually, a super cool thing to, I mean, once things are safe, to go out and kind of do some sifting and testing and see what's out there. So, now let's talk about spiders. Oh boy. How many people were afraid of spiders or are afraid of spiders? I was terrified of spiders when I was growing up. I mean, I was so afraid of spiders that my mom used to take me to the Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. And, and have me go behind the scenes and have them try and tell me how. I, I refused to sleep in my bedroom because there were windows. So I would go and sleep in the innermost room in the house because especially in the summer you could hear the insects on the screens and I was afraid spiders were gonna get in. Uh, and it wasn't until after I quit my corporate job and I was taking a class with a friend of mine. Well, Joe, you met Joe. You mm -hmm. who came to yeah. talk to you about birds. Um, we were we were taking the class up into the Sierra, and we were driving, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the road, there was a tarantula, and he made the entire class pull over. We were in a caravan, <laughs> pulled over to the side of the road, and he said, "Okay, we're not going anywhere until Gwen holds the spider." <laughs> Meanwhile, traffic is stopping. I'm in the middle of the road. Everybody's around me, and I'd be like, "Okay, I'm ready." No, 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 no. And that went on forever. I mean, I got like literally goosebumps when I like sick when I felt like you know I had to hold it. But the thing that was so amazing is as soon as that spider was in my hand, I absolutely fell in love. I mean, feeling those like little legs, realizing that it wasn't going to bite me. And part of it is having something that had been such a fear for so long, like switched off in that one moment. And you really, you know, you, you have the opportunity to do that with folks at an even younger age, which is kind of cool. So ever since then, um, it was a couple of years later, I was back from graduate school. Joe asked me to come co-teach memology with him at the College of Marin. We were out in Tamala's Point, and there were all these pumpkin spiders all over the place, and I was picking them up and showing them to people and stuff, and mm -hmm. got home, and he like, called me, he's like, do you realize what you were doing today? <laughs> well, I wouldn't hold a pumpkin spider. <laughs> <laughs> and now, you know, we cohabit. I mean, I love this cartoon. There she was, alone and pregnant again. <laughs> Where had that no-god husband of hers gone? Why had he disappeared? Then, of course, she remembered she'd eaten him. <laughs> Immediately, her spirits lifted. <laughs> oh, sorry, guys, but you know, I like to say when we talk about spiders, it's interesting that you know that male is an anagram for meal. <laughs> and if we look at spider courtship and stuff, a lot of it has to do with how the male actually ends up not being eaten. Um, and it's pretty interesting. So, you're going to be talking about insects in a couple of weeks, but um, what is the difference between a spider and an insect? The number of legs. Six number six of legs? No, two segments instead of three, right? Two instead of three? Uh -huh. No wings. <laughs> no wings on a spider? What else? Spinnerets? Yeah. Um, yeah, that could be. What Although spiders say? molt to grow and the sort of gradual metamorphosis of some insects is kind of like that. Uh, spiders jump. Oh. Spiders can jump, but so do fleas and leafhoppers and oh, Yeah, jumping spiders, we'll talk about that in there. Like one of my favorite things. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the other things is the antenna. Insects have antenna. Uh -huh. Spiders have these chelicera, and then they have these little palps that have different um, uses. Yeah. 
we're not really going to do that. So I just, I can't even tell you how, like, I don't, think about molting. Think about, think about if you had to shed the lining of your lungs and the covering of your eyes and the, I mean, when you molt, everything molts, you know, I mean, it's, and, and then this whole other thing comes out. I mean, here it is, you know, sort of pulling itself. There's a little, I studied crab molting more than I studied spider molting. And my one professor who grew up, grew up, went to school at UC Berkeley, did his graduate work there on crabs. And he said, and it was in the 60s, he said one of their favorite things to do was to, to drop a little acid and contemplate crab molting. <laughs> they get themselves kind of all. <laughs> so I, hopefully this will work. I'm not going to turn the sound up because the sound for this one sort of like sounds like some odd like Thing. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. Here's a wolf spider. No, we don't need a veil bond. <laughs> That's sped up, right? It's sped up, but not that much. Look at that. Look at that. Here, the legs come. Pulling the legs out of the old legs. Oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Where are the legs coming out? Where? The legs are here, coming out of the old legs. There it is. Here's its old skeleton, exoskeleton. Here's the normal speed. <laughs> Waiting for the head to move. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 It's not that different from the There it is. Oh, it's Do you see of the Yeah, You can see it. Or just, I mean, the molded part? Yes. So, okay, how about um, all of those little things that look like spiders in the corner of your house that aren't really spiders. Those are like little spider molts. Most of them are molts. So go look at them. And, you know, just like with a crab, I mean, some of the spider eyes are so small. If it was a, but, you know, if it looks sort of milky and starts to smell bad, then it's a dead spider. Um, most of them are just little molts. I, I looked when I came in here, but they keep this room a little too clean. Um, you usually find the, what we call daddy long legs, but a lot of those are, yeah. I have a whole bunch of, um, you know, the, the spiders that make little lacy things that are actually from uh, Australia, but they're all over the house where I live on the preserve, and a lot of them um, live in the kitchen with me, and I occasionally have to clean up their little molts and their um, remains of their dinner, uh -huh. so it doesn't litter that. So let's talk, I'm just going to talk about general characteristics in spider identification. I have a handout for you today, like one of those trail booklets that I make, like you had for the, um, and you're going to take those and go out into the big wide world and try to find some of these things. Um, in the coming week, but I wanted to go over some of the key characteristics used in identification of spiders that no matter what spider you're looking at. I will say, for the most part, spiders are pretty small, and to see a lot of these things, um, they need to be subdued, which usually means dead, and you need to be looking under a microscope. But some of them you can actually see with your naked eye. And this information is in your little handout. So here are the spinnerets. This is the underside of a silver banded garden spider that was in my yard. And you can see that, I mean, the spider's large enough so that you can see the spinnerets. A lot of the garden spiders are. And if you look at what that actually looked like, here it is. So remember that picture we saw on the first slide? That was just those. And then there's all these other spinnerets. So what, and what is, 
So all those individual things, they're all spinnerets. Only one silk comes out, right? It looks, or are you saying that on that maybe 20 different things come out at the same time or and more. form one cord? If it's a corbellet spider, it can be thousands at one point. Oh. Then they actually have little things on their legs like a comb that cards it. Um, and the thing that's cool about spider silk is when it's coming out of here, it's actually a liquid protein. So it's coming out as a liquid, but what makes it actually um, solid is tension. So that dropping of the spider or the you know wind picking it up and moving it. So that's how it goes from liquid to silk. And there's different kinds of silk that are all used for different things that the spider. A spider can have one single spider can have up to six or seven different kinds of spider silk. Yeah. Is it spinning them into a single a single string or is it spinning like a thread? Um, in some instances, in some instances they just like all kind of attach together. Some they actually some kinds of silk they're carding it so that it gets sort of electrostatically charged. Yeah, and here this is a little blurry picture, but I loved so you could see the silk glands right. inside the abdomen. A good Amazing. chunk of the abdomen of the spider is those silk glands, and here's like the spinnerets and the different kinds of, you know, structural silk and we'll talk. So, though that's the same picture and the different um, spigots <coughs> are different sizes, and different kinds of silk are coming out of those different kinds of spigots. All at the same time. Um, it depends so. upon what the spider is doing. So if it's making swathing silk for an egg sac, some kinds of silk will be coming out. If it's making a drag line, a different kind of silk. Um, the one kind of glands actually has silk that's just for wrapping prey. Which is what this one's doing. Which is what this pumpkin spider um, I captured wrapping her prey. Um, the, some glands produce spider silk that is just for wrapping eggs. And if something like the garden spider, <coughs> it's usually six different envelopes of different kinds of silk. And the final one is the one that ends up being um, more waterproof. The inner one is the one that's all fluffy and kind of cushions the eggs. Here are different spider egg sacs. The wool spider, you know, she's always pushing her egg sac around. You can find them a lot. And when that, the, the spiderlings, um, chalicera, that jaws aren't strong enough to break open the egg sac, so mom breaks it open. And when she breaks open the egg sac, they all crawl out and onto her back and ride around um, for a while. Here's one of the spiders that you see in your houses, that what some people call daddy long legs. And Pay attention to them. When you start paying attention to them, you'll see the female, when she makes her eggs, she carries that whole egg sac around in her mouth. Um, here's a yellow and black garden spider egg sac, jumping spider. Here's a pumpkin spider. Here is all of the little hatched spiderlings that are coming out of this egg sac. Um, it's on my friend May's ceiling. <laughs> And here you can see the spiderlings inside the egg sac go through their first molt. And then, um, so the egg hatches, the spider, then they go through the first molt, and then it's when they come out. And one thing that's really cool that you will eventually get to see again at the Blueberry Preserve is you know how you were seeing those little holes, I think, yeah. where the yeah. false tarantulas mm -hmm. lived? After the first rains, those false tarantulas clean out their... Um, holes, I guess, basically, I can't think of the word that I want, um, burrows, and around the edges you'll find last year's egg sac, and, you know, sometimes they're molt, you know, like, oh, this was so last year. <laughs> <laughs> Is it one, one egg for all the little spiderlings? Or? One egg sac. And then in that egg sac are, you know, like the garden spiders that we see a lot of, a lot of those yellow and black garden spiders, the big ones, they have four to five hundred eggs in there. Yeah. Yeah. So there's another gland that um, actually produces the sticky silk that you find in webs, um, and they have these little droplets. Here is, I'm not going to go into um, too much of this, but there's some really cool information that's fairly recent that is looking at the way, like the, where's the, 
the spiders, well, these hairy legs that have all of these different parts. Different things are actually being used to run around on the web so that the spider isn't sticking mm -hmm. in the web. There's also special silk that is just for drag lines and the frames of the webs and the safety lines that they leave behind as they move about. Things like jumping spiders and wolf spiders that aren't orb weavers, they will, the females will put out their drag lines and they'll lace them with pheromones and that's how the male spiders actually find them. They find a drag line. <laughs> it smells really good. <laughs> There's um, glands that are producing silk that are just for the attachment discs, you know, so the little disc that's spun to drop down from. This is a cool scanning EM shot of the liquid silk coming out of the <coughs> spinnerets. And then there's these cribolate <coughs> spiders, I guess cribolate glands, and this is actually, all of those little tiny things are spades. So thousands of strands are coming out. These little cones on the spider's legs are carding it like you would card wool. And this isn't sticky silk. It's actually, I mean, you know, glue sticky. It's sticky, electrostatically sticky. And you can tell, like, things like black widows and um, when you find their silk, how it's sort of grayish and it snaps, crackles. And when you find it, it's that um, crevolate spit. So, and I have this picture here. Why? What is this? Hummingbird. Hummingbird nest. Why would this be here? Spider web. Spider webs. Spider webs. Yeah. I thought it was so interesting. You know, I remember going to the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. How many? How many people have been to the Desert Museum? Cool place. Is there a high desert in Oregon? No, in uh, Tucson. Tucson. This one, they have a hummingbird aviary. That's amazing. And I remember being there right after they first put it up. And then years later, when they decided to clean it, and they cleaned it so well that the hummingbirds that first started nesting, the eggs were falling through, and they realized that the hummingbirds actually needed the spiders in the aviary in order to collect the silk. And it turns out that a lot of the silk that's in birds' nests is not like webbing silk, it's egg sac silk. And it does this whole thing where it kind of like loops together like Velcro. So you're saying they go and take the silk from the, uh, from the egg sacs and the, you know, collecting, yeah. yeah. How many people, oops. <coughs> I've seen something that looks kind of like this. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. yeah? Okay. I like it. It's so cool. <laughs> so remember I said that in order to become solid, um, it needs, you know, the silk needs tension. So if you were a spider and you had to get from one place to another, but, you know, oh my god, I'm not an insect. I don't have wings. What should I do? Um, if you actually, you know, sat on something and stuck your little butt up in the air on a good day. When do we usually see, when, when do we usually see these, the spider ballooning? Yeah. What time of year? Spring. spring and fall. And think about what's happening in the spring and fall. You have cool nights and those sort of warm centers to the day. So what does that create? It creates drafts, updrafts. So if you wanted to get from one place to another and you were a spider, you could stick your little butt up in the air and you could start letting out this liquid silk that the wind would catch and stretch out and stretch out and stretch out and it stretches it out until there's enough mass to pick the spider up off of the platform and take it airborne. So that's what's happening in those days when you see all of that silk in the air. It's a lot of times it's a spider ballooning event. And when I first started in years and years and years ago when I first started looking this up, um, all of the places that I was finding stuff had to do with UFOs because people thought that they were seeing UFOs because there was such a mass of spider silk in the way that the light was reflecting. So, so those that, what I would call the drag line going across there, uh, those aren't the beginning of a web. They're just a way for them to get from one place to the next. Well, some of them, I mean, these are two really tall, trees that are actually really far apart. <laughs> this is a 
mountain. And so, you know, you're seeing a lot of silk. Um, so if you're hiking or walking and you see a line across, um, a lot of times those are a drag line that is the start of a web or it is, a spider will actually do that to get across a trail too sometimes. Well, spiders um, eat their own web. I mean, will they re recycle that material? Um, a lot of times they won't necessarily recycle the balloon silk, but they definitely recycle a lot of the other silk, especially their web silk, which is why when we're out there and people, you know, use the little spritzer bottles and stuff like that to highlight the webs when you're, you know, with friends or family or kids, um, we want to make sure that you're not using tap water because that, you know, now that they use chloramine in a lot of it, we can't even, like, let it sit out and let the chlorine evaporate. So you want to use distilled water, or, um, you know, really. Yeah, so yes, they do. Because think about it, that's all liquid protein. That's huge expense to actually produce that to the spider. Right? Okay, yeah. question. How fast can they, like, if, if they're sitting on the tree on the left and there's a wind blowing, how fast can they let that, that uh, silk out? I mean, as fast as the wind takes it? Uh-huh, pretty much. I mean, that's why they found spiders 30,000 feet up in the... You know, up in the air. Darwin found them, like, in the middle of the ocean when he was studying. I mean, they, they're sort of, they're kind of aerial plankton, if you think about it. They can't really um, say where they're going to go. They're at the mercy of the winds, but, um, yeah. Oh, this is so cool. So, um, spider silk apparently has some amazing characteristics, and there's this really interesting guy in Japan who is, um, more of a physicist and was working on other things but also interested in music and he thought well I wonder what it would sound like if I actually made violin strings from spider silk so those golden orb weavers that produce the longest he uh, made and I don't remember now I probably have it in my notes it's something like 15,000 strands for like one of the smaller strings I'm kind of collecting that and he can we do this they've done all of these studies and the resonances that are created with the spider silk because it's actually sort of a living protein that creates it um, are really amazing but it's super expensive um, in order to get enough and, and think about so think about spiders and think about spider silk um, it's very rare to be able to say about something all members in this group are something I mean in but if you think about spiders, all members in this group are what? How do they make their living? Carnivores. Carnivores. So if you wanted to raise all those spiders producing all those silk, you'd have to be raising all those insects and feeding all of them. And, you know, it's different than, like, silkworms where you can just throw a bunch of mulberry leaves in there and, you know, they're happy. Um, and that became a problem, you know, the um, armed services, of course, were really interested in spider silk because it's so strong. Um, it's stronger than Kevlar, and so they were doing a whole lot of research to see, in, you know, is there a way that humans could tap into this amazing um, substance? And so what they did for a while was they took spider genes and actually put them in goats so that when they milked the goats, they could collect the spider silk from the goat milk. And that was a whole team up in Canada. It didn't end up working <laughs> yeah. okay so they in our reading it talked about uh, making some kind of a tunic or something that tapestry. tapestry would it be sticky as anything that tapestry made of uh, spider silk well 
there's only, remember when you think about spiders, only one of the kinds of silk is sticky. So if they're collecting the other kind of silk, then it wouldn't be. Um, this is kind of cool too. What this one luthier figured out is if um, you didn't need to make all the strings of spider silk if you made the violin body out of silkworm silk and put spider silk underneath where the strings were. That, um, gloves yeah <laughs> females um, don't females are slender so the petty palps besides doing other things are actually the sperm transfer device um, and the thing that's interesting about male spiders is the where the sperm is made is not connected to these at all so in order to charge these the male spins what's called a sperm web like gets it all full of sperm and then goes and charges his petty palps and then goes off in search of a female. And you can look, this is what a fairly simple pedipalp, this is a fairly complex pedipalp. So when you're thinking about, I mean, what would be, what would be some of the reasons why you would have that difference in the pedipalps? Because each of them each you before you can do it. Females might eat you before you can Females might eat you. I'm thinking more lock and key. So the female part for this species actually looks very simple, like where the where the pedipalp is inserted in the epigyne. And the female part for this species is fairly complicated. So it is kind of like a lock and key. So you're not going to have cross species. Um, And there's the little slit on the female where the pedipalps are inserted. So you can imagine if you're a male spider and knowing that the female might eat you, you would come up with a bunch of different ways to actually, some, you saw how soft that spider looked, you said vulnerable, that was molting. There's some, some whole groups of spiders where the males will only mate with the females right after she's molted because her jaws aren't strong enough. Uh -huh. <laughs> others, like a lot of crab spiders, the male will bind the female with silk, sort of a little bondage, I guess. <laughs> and some of them have these like little locking thumbs that lock her jaws so that she can't. So here, oh my god. How many people have seen jumping spiders? Aren't they the cutest thing? <laughs> I cohabited with one once. Oh my god, I love them. So, one of the things I love is jumping spider courtship. Those palps are also part of the mating or the courtship dance. 
and and then they wave their legs and they look sort of like those guys that are bringing planes in <laughs> red and the females looking at them and they do all these different things but what we didn't know until a couple of years ago is that they're also like flamenco dancers. Nobody had ever recorded the sounds that they make while they're doing that. So, I'm just going to show you some stuff. <laughs> Put them on like really sensitive. Um, yeah, and it's on a really sensitive. Um, lovely jumping spider that lived right outside my cabin when I was in graduate school. I lived in a cabin up in the mountains above Santa Barbara and was one of the really beautiful ones that had the red abdomen. And I would bring flies and feed it to him or caterpillars and we would eat lunch together a lot. <laughs> and then I started learning about more about them and I thought, well, you know, I just am never going to be the recipient of that. <laughs> I'm too big and, you know. But then I thought, well, they also do some of it when it's territorial. So I wondered, well, I wonder if I hold a mirror up to the spider, if I can get it to display. And it did. Oh, oh my God. God. It's not the full thing, but it, you know, it did some of it. Um, we don't have time to, um, to watch this, really. Oh. 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 These spiders are from Australia, and it's beyond belief. Many species dance. Albatross bond with a duet and a duel. Bees waggle to tell their hive where food is. But when it comes to bust and move, no group gets a group in the more distinct and mesmerizing ways than the peacock spiders. Oh, <laughs> Not only does each species 
that cut spider genus, Moratus, have its own signature style and swagger? <laughs> Many drop their own unique beat. They sound like aboriginals, or the aboriginals sound like them. <laughs> and if you're surprised that these spiders have moves like Jagger, they're not alone. Just to see the, the fan lift up and, and splay out a little bit. This thing is real, it is in nature. <laughs> Yeah. As a grad student at UC Berkeley's Rosenblum lab, Madeline Gerard's goal is to translate and catalog the displays of these eight-legged beatboxes. I'm trying to understand why these spiders sort of have evolved really allowed their displays to court females, and just exactly what females are cueing on, and what, what makes a male good or not good. To answer these questions, Gerard and colleagues needed to catch a wide variety of these tiny dancers and their female counterparts. They sort of blend in with your environment. And a lot of females from different species look almost identical, so you, you can never really tell what a female is unless there are males around to sort of be like, oh, okay, that's, that's the male that goes with this female. From various habitats along Australia's western and eastern coast, dozens of peacock spiders were collected, some previously identified, and some brand new to science. We definitely have the uh, gotta catch them all sort of mentality. These specimens were brought back to Gerard's lab, where she could capture male performances in a controlled setting. I use a set of pantyhose over a, a, a nylon frame, essentially, and with that stretched very tightly, we, we put the spiders on that and um, can record their, their vibrations. Which tells researchers what the female spider would feel during the dance. Spiders don't have ears in the same way that we have ears. They've got sense organs in their leg that are able to sort of detect surface movements um, in the ground. But like all other groups of jumping spiders, the Moratus are a highly visual genus, so often the dance begins with each species' unique visual pickup line. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> but then, you know, when a female orients at a male, he'll very promptly lift up his abdomen and sort of split out the fin and start waving it from side to side with his legs. And now each species can dance to the rhythm of their own drum. Some more strange than others. Like this previously undescribed species, currently called the Sparkle Muffin. <laughs> In between these bouts of booty shaking, a male will actually pause that, that display, and that's when he vibrates. Us watching doesn't really look like he's doing much during that time. You just sort of see his abdomen moving up, back and forth, but um, he's actually making vibrations, and then he'll sort of resume the, the fin waving display. Finally, if the female likes what she sees, she lets the male initiate a grand finale. And he does this sort of end display where um, he brings his legs, front legs, over the female, and it with his third legs out to the side. And a lot of peacock spiders of different species seem to have that very same ending. Full disclosure, the females in the lab are pinned in place with removable wax, and not just so that they can get clean recordings of visuals and acoustics of the courtship. In the lab, I've, I've had cannibalism happen. The males that are, you know, less, less up to female standards. <laughs> Each species appears to have its own standards, but Gerard's initial experiments with the Moratus volon species hints that what a female prefers is a male who can dance and sing eagerly. If you're better at singing, you're better at dancing too. You're just sort of overall a better male. <laughs> at least the ones who've done a lot of work, sort of the conditions are all standardized. The combination of both of those things and both of those things sort of performed better is, is important. But even though we know that females like a quality performance, we still don't know what the dance is actually saying. But they're not giving them parental care, they're not providing a, a territory for the females to live, they're not giving food. So, you know, the, the, probably the thing that it could indicate is something about sort of males' genetic quality, but um, I, I don't know. It could just sort of be a really attractive signal that females are moving in on. It sure got our attention. <laughs> <laughs> Science Friday, I'm Luke Cross. Yes. Little bit longer than I intended to go, but really. Oh, we wanted to see it. Yeah.
again. Um, and so here's what she was talking about, the little sense organs in the legs of the spiders, um, called lyriform organs, because they look like a lyre. So those are sensing vibrations. And if you think about spiders on webs, if you think about female spiders listening to male spiders, some of the orb weavers, the male goes and actually plucks a mating song on the web, so the female knows that it's um, you know, somebody wanting to mate. And of course, other spiders have figured out how to pluck a different species mating song and trick the female so that she will come out and eat her. <laughs> All sorts of stuff going on there. One of the spiders. Um, in our garden spiders, how many people have seen these in their gardens, those big yellow and black? So around this time of year, when you're seeing the big ones, is when they're making, the, getting ready to make their egg sacs. And when you see one like that, look for the male. Okay. See how tiny? Wow. 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 So you can see, you need to be a little careful. This one has an interesting thing where the male will actually go into reversible seizure after he lets go of his second pedipalp and act kind of like a copulation plug so no other males can come and deposit their sperm. So yeah, there's the X-rated part. We talked about you know binding and little things that little uh, things that cause the female's jaws to lock and plucking mating songs and all sorts of stuff. <coughs> one other thing that um, we can see is the eye pattern. So here's a wolf spider, and all wolf spiders sort of have that typical eye pattern. Here's a jumping spider. They're just so cute. The crab spider. Here's a tarantula. And why do you think, I mean, why would the eyes be so small there? Where does it live? Underground. Yeah. So it doesn't really need to see that much. This was taken, I don't remember by who, but it was a Bouvery docent wow. on their porch. This is a, a deck chair, and here's a black widow that caught a sharp-tailed snake. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's an extraordinary. Yeah. Oh, Mark? Yeah. Sakara? Wow. And I have this here. There's a lot of different things that actually predate on spiders. Uh, are mud daubers and spider hops, the mud daubers, when you see those little mud things, they pack their larval chambers with chemically refrigerated spiders so that when the eggs hatch, the spiders, the um, wasp larvae have something to eat. All right, how are we doing timelines? What is the, what is the agenda, Julia, today? Like, how long do we have? Well, we could listen to you for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> but we're getting people out of here by one, and I'd like to have 20 minutes at the end to okay. answer questions and talk about next week and go okay. over the concepts. And Good. So Thank you. Rock on. You're okay. Great. Um, bugs, what can you tell me about them? They're fun. They're fun. <laughs> I know. Roly like polies. Roly polies. And um, what are they? What are they? What are they related to? Crabs. Oh, crabs. 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 Right. They're a crustacean. Not armadillos. Well, they look like armadillos, but but they'll eat goldfish food. Hmm? Said so they'll eat goldfish food. They'll eat goldfish food. And do you ever find I? If you look closely, you can find two-toned ones. Mm -hmm. <coughs> What's really cool about that is these molt half and half. So they'll molt half of, and then they'll molt the other half. So a lot of times you'll find ones that look two-toned because only half of them has mol have molted. Um, they're actually isopods. So what does iso mean? Like isosceles and isobar? Same. 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 So isopod, same foot. So if you think about a lot of other crustaceans, you know, um, like lobsters and crabs and stuff, they have different size feet. Isopods, all their little feet look the same. And the females have a marsupium. They actually will hold their little uh, brood broods. This I have in here because I taught parasitology for many years. Here is an actual parasit marine isopod that is a parasitic isopod that goes in and replaces the tongue of a fish. Oh, oh wow. It just oh, lives its life there, like bathed in the world. Oh, cool. Yes. Uh, 
So just to let you know that you know we have a little roly polies, but there's all sorts of other isoclads out there. We find cool ones in the tide pools. How about millipedes? Have people seen this one with the bright yellow? On this, there's certain times of year where we see this a lot. That one's called the almond millipede. Um, and why might it be called that? Oh, releases. releases cyanide. Um, yeah, so cyanide smells like almonds, so that's one of its defense mechanisms. Uh, millipedes are basically vegetarians, so I don't feel bad about picking them up when I find them. Centipedes, on the other hand, aren't, so I sort of leave the centipedes alone because they have more. What's the little thing at the end of the little break? That. Um, is a phen phenagoded. Um, I'm not sure what its common name is, but it's basically our um, relative of a glowworm, which is a oh, beetle. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. the female retains the larval body form, um, doesn't really. And she loves to eat millipedes and will start at one end and sort of work her way down. And this picture was actually taken at Bouverie. I've seen them at Bouverie a number of times. It's eating the millipede. It's eating the millipede. That's a beetle eating the millipede. And that's actually an adult female beetle that you know still has her larval form. What's the name of it again? Phenagoded. P H. P H E N. And what's the black one called again? That is called the almond millipede. Or sometimes it's called the night train millipede because when you see it crawling around on a darker forest floor, those like little, looks like a night train with the windows on, you know, the windows on. <laughs> okay, there are times of year where I see them all over the place. Um, I'm trying to remember when that is. <laughs> yes, these are young. And some actual, some millipedes, some millipedes, millipede moms like hang out and kind of brood their young for a while. That's, this one was one of the ones that was doing that that was found. I think back under the redwoods and the When they're born, they look almost transparent. They do. But you can see how they look a lot like the adults, and so they yeah. just keep molting to get bigger. This like stopped working, so then it was just a. Oh, great. Seems to have blown up my PowerPoint. Oh dear. It'll come back. <laughs> you can see how there's only one pair of legs per segment. Millipedes have two. Um, and this has mouth parts that are able to pack a wall up. All right. So our last phylum that we're talking about um, <coughs> are the mollusks. Well, no, that's not actually not the last one. Um, so most of the mollusks we see around, you know, here when we're hiking with the kids are the snails and the slugs. But I just wanted to put it in perspective that, you know, octopi, which have are amazing predators and have eyes very much like human eyes, are in the same group of animals as are nudibranchs and clams and all of that stuff. It's a really interesting group. These are um, some of the mollusks that you might see with kids. Both of these were from the Bouverie Preserve. They're actually a native snail. Um, and here's the banana slug, of course. And here's the non-native, the helix that was brought in for escargot that we see all over the place now. <coughs> so you've been hanging out. You've found some banana slugs when you've been out on the trail, right? So tell me six cool things. About banana slugs. <coughs> Don't touch them. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, but you want to feel that, right? Slime. They make slime. So yeah. slime is amazing. That's one thing. What they else? Poop out of their side. They poop out of their sides. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if this is really true or urban legend, or you just made yourself think this. But when we were hiking with kids when I was teaching school. We go on these overnight field trips. You had to belong to the Kiss a Slug group and if you kiss the slug there was something 
either in my lips or the slug that kind of deaden your lips for them. It's yeah. true. They have, um, there's some like anesthetizing yeah. chemicals in the slug slime, which is why when I get stinging nettle, the first thing I do is look for a banana slug and let it prime around wherever I got the stinging nettle. It works really well. <coughs> yeah. Um, what? Tetrodotoxin? Is that the, the stuff that brings? No, that's that's the thing that's in this, the newts. Yeah, they, 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 these aren't really toxic. Um, what else? So I, I've heard that they um, can cover themselves with dirt and leaf debris to keep cool. Is that true? Well, a lot of times they'll go, you know, un, partially underground or in old holes or behind bark on a tree and stuff when it's really dry. So yeah. Um, what else do we know about them? They're different kinds of slime. Different kinds of slime. We do. We're not going to look at that, but that's that is definitely true, which is cool. What else? They're the mascot for UCSC. <laughs> UCSC. <laughs> yes. All right. So let's go through. Here is one pooping out its side, and it's not coming out of this hole. That's its lung. It's coming out of the hole, right below it, underneath the mantle. It, 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 doesn't the bottom side, isn't that just a whole series of munchie? That, uh, the bottom side yeah. of the slug? It's um, what's called the foot, and it's muscular. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what is it? What, what, what? Why are they pooping out their side? What's the deal there? <laughs> yeah, so what happens, one of the things that's really cool is if you think about a slug like this, the land snails and slugs evolved from snails that had shells, right? So if you were a snail with a shell, would you want to poop out of your end? No, you'd be fouling your home. So what actually ends up happening, that snail, that shell sitting up there, and um, what snails, what happens with snails is when they're developing, they undergo something called torsion, where as the larva develops, their whole digestive system, everything goes up, turns around, and comes over to one side. So everything's coming out. So they can just sort of stick that one side out of the shell and poop, and that's where um, the entrance and exit to their, I mean, that's where the, the sex parts are, um, that little pneumostone, um, or the, another, another name for the land slugs, lungs in essence is it sort of took the mantle cavity of the um, aquatic snail and kind of covered it up so that it, you can, you've seen that open and close, right? Where's its head? The right it's one. right here. Huh? Yeah, so here's, here's banana slug poop. <laughs> here's the anatomy, so there's the lungs. Here's the genital opening, here's the anus, and that's underneath that thing called the mantle. And then this whole thing is like a muscular foot, basically. And the tentacles, those little things up here, those are sensing light so that their eyes, the smaller ones that are you know, facing down, <coughs> actually touch and smell chemosensory. Here's just a little picture about that torsion, so as the the snail develops, everything goes and twists out the one side. Here's another cool thing about slugs is that radula. Remember we talked about that tongue? So different snails have different configurations of these teeth. And they have this sort of like conveyor belt that goes out and they rasp. Here's a picture of it. Of the snail. I'm not going to do that one because it'll. Here's one munching down on a mushroom, which they really like. One of the things I like to do is to see how many different things I can find banana slugs eating when I go out there. I like did one hike one time and had 23 different pictures. I mean, they were eating mushrooms, but it was different mushrooms, or they were eating poop, but it was different poop, or they were eating. You know. Can can they eat toxic mushrooms? I. Not sure. That's a good question. I, I mean, I've seen them eating pretty much everything. So here's one about to do a line of slime mold. 
come. <laughs> Here, I love this picture. I took this in Point Reyes. Here's a banana slug eating poop. And here's banana slug poop. <laughs> so that whole thing about, you know, not shitting where you eat. <laughs> if what you eat is... <laughs> I guess it doesn't really make sense. Here's the slime. Amazing slime, some of the... And, and one of the things, you know, it's laying down a layer of slime and then the muscles um, on the foot deform that slime differently, which gives it traction and allows it to actually move. I think you use these little plexiglass things here where you can, like, actually the kids can watch. I have what I call slug TV um, because of where the house at the preserve where I live is situated. The living room window is like a slug magnet, so you can just sit there in the living room and watch the slugs. <laughs> Here, I've seen this happen multiple times. Here's a California giant salamander trying to eat a banana slug that produces so much slime. I've watched it twice from start to finish. After about three hours, the salamander just gives up. Wow. But you can see, look at all that slime. There's a mouth. It's like trying to, and finally the slug just goes away. Getting out. This was actually in the orchard in Volunteer Canyon. Um, it's hard to tell. There's the top of it, there's the bottom of it, but this slime rope was about eight feet tall. It was a banana slug lowering itself from an apple tree. We use the slime as a... Here's the, that's sort of talking about all of the different contractions that the muscles are making on that slime thing, and which ones stick and which ones slip. So it's a pretty cool... And then one of the other cool things about banana slugs is that they are both male and female. They're hermaphrodites, right? I, I remember a poem that I saw years ago that I really liked that was called Ode to a Slug. And all it said was, know thyself. <laughs> <laughs> of course, they don't with them. <coughs> they, have, they, need to, they don't self-fertilize. They need to find another slug in order to do it. And they sort of do this whole preparing to mate thing. So there was five cool things about banana slugs. The sixth one is X-rated, which is a pofflation and love darts. Um, people have a sense. Do people remember what that's all about? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Hormones. Huh? Oh, chemical uh, hormones are injecting. Yeah, so they're sticking these love darts. I mean, they're firing them. Um, I think I have a picture. Here's a clean, here's a shot, a dart covered with mucus. Sometimes they go right through the other snail's head, but they're basically um, yeah, sort of increasing the hormonal. Um, and they come in a variety of all different sizes incredible. and forms, yeah. And what's the purpose of, of the dart? Um, they say that the ones like with that that certain ones with the darts are actually more likely to be the ones that fertilize the eggs. So it's a it's partially hormonal. Um, they've read different articles that claim different things. So I, I'm being evasive because I'm trying to remember which one was actually the one that I thought was. And then there's this population thing. So slugs have really large penises for their body size, and every once in a while, one gets stuck. So the partner will actually bite it off. <laughs> Disconnect. Does it grow back? It doesn't. Um, and there's all sorts of studies done, you know, like, well, then is it at a disadvantage, or, you know, because it's walking around without. Um, they haven't really sort of determined the evolutionary uh, benefit at this point. And here's just, you know, one of our native snails with its shell. They're just beautiful. A lot of times when you find them, they're much more flattened. Um, and one of the ones that's more common has that beautiful reddish body. This is this you definitely find at Blueberry, who can pronounce it Helminthoflupta Sonoma <laughs> and Haplotrima Minima. So, so one yeah? Can you go 
end up picking the last one there on the bottom. What I find those shells, they're very white. Is what I'm seeing in the color there, the color of the body inside? So. Well, is it still alive? No. No, no so it's bleached it. out. Just oh, like a so lot of times you can find, you know, like the helix shells and they look all white too. So once something's not there maintaining it, they just kind okay, of so it's not just that it's clear and something's going to look yeah. How much of it is inside that shell? Um, a fair amount, and it can pull a, a bunch more of it in. So is it being Sonoma because it's native to that area? I think so. I think it. I think that you know either it was discovered there, but I think that that particular one has um, a narrower range. I, you know, when I first did this slide it was probably about 15 years ago, and I actually contacted Peter Rupnerine, who's at Cal Academy or was at Cal Academy, who was the the mollusk guy. Um, and I forget what his answer was, but, <laughs> but it's, it's either, you know, it's discovered there or it's restricted. Right. Yeah. yeah. So one last group that we're, like, big group that we're looking at, the phylum Analyta, which is the earthworms, um, the polychaete worms, the tube worms, although I think they may be reclassifying those, like, bent worms that you find near the deep sea. And what's this? may be doubted if there are any other animals which have played such an important part in the history of the world as these lowly organized creatures. That's what Charles Darwin said. Um, he spent a lot of time paying attention to the earthworms in his um, back garden. I love this. You look different. Did you do something to your tubercula cuberatus? This thing? So that's just basically saying there's not a lot of structure. <laughs> But they do have these like little, remember I showed you those, that picture, that the little CK? Um, and what is one of the more sensitive parts of your body? Lips. Lips, right? Really sensitive, that's why kissing is so much fun. Um, and this, if you find an earthworm, which we usually do after it rains, and why do we find them after it rains? They can move around. Mm -hmm. they can move around. That could be one reason, another reason. They can breathe. They can breathe, yeah. They breathe through their skin. So they don't want to stay in waterlogged soil. They have to come up to breathe. So we find a lot of them. And if you find them, if you take one and rub it gently across your lips, you can feel the little tiny um, CK that are there. I always think that that's cool because, you know, you think about all of those old cartoons where the robin is like <coughs> tugging and tugging. And like, well, you look at the shape of it and it's like, phew, it should just come right out. But it has this great um, hydra <laughs> static skeleton and these little like sticky things and it can actually like, kind of grab on. Yeah. So. And, uh, they can, if they're divided, they can uh, regenerate, yes, no? Um, uh, depends upon where you where, divide them. Where? Yeah, they're not quite like those like amazing flatworms. People remember those where you yeah. cut the head in half and it had grow two heads and you cut the tail and four tails. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, one cool thing is they have five, in quote, hearts, um, which is kind of a, an interesting thing to be able to tell the kids. Yeah. They eat dirt or soil. Aristotle called them the intestines of the soil. In just one acre, there can be more than one million. Eating 10 tons of leaves, stems, and dead roots a year and turning over 40 tons of soil. Remember that thing that I showed you about the biomass? Yeah. An earthworm has no lungs or gills. It breathes through its skin which is in contact with the air between particles of soil. So we talked about what happens when it rains. What's this? You see it a lot across the paths a lot. This is a path. Oh, it's a tunnel. Like a mole tunnel. Mm -hmm. And we see them across the paths a lot right after it rains. And what is their favorite food? 
Earthworms. So what are they doing? They're creating these tunnels. The earthworms have to come up so that they can breathe. The moles provide this great little tunnel of air. The earthworms come up into the tunnel, and the moles cruise along and eat the earthworms that have come. So they're basically hurting earthworms when you. And I've witnessed this actually. I've seen you know like earthworms getting sucked down because of the tunnel. The first time I saw it, I, it was so bad. I was by myself because I was so excited. Like I think you showed this, but it was cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so they move through the soil using their hydrostatic skeleton and their CK. And you can see that they're able to constrict and expand and constrict and expand and sort of push through the soil and use those little CK to stick in there. And what is that lump in the middle? That's the clitellum, and it's used for sex. Um, another X rated part of this class. I like I could do a little bit more in this venue. Have, are people familiar with um, Isabella Rossellini's Green Porno? No. <laughs> She's amazing. Um, you know, she was an actress. Then she went back. I actually saw her live in San Francisco several years ago. She went back to graduate school and got a degree in ecology. And then she thought, how can I combine my acting <laughs> with my ecology? And she's produced tons of these like mini films for like Sundance and stuff. Um, do people want to see her doing earthworm? Okay, we have just enough time to do that. <laughs> I couldn't do the slug one because it was actually a little too racy. <laughs> we stay after this. We stay after class. If I were an earthworm, I would have no brain. I would have a long, slimy body like a tube. It would be formed by many segments. At one end, I would have a mouth, but no teeth. I suck up my food. <laughs> At the other end of my body, I would have my anus to defecate. But I would pee from each segment and breathe from each segment. I am a very common worm, yet the names of two Greek gods, Hermes and Aphrodite, are needed to describe me. I am both male and female. To have babies, I need to mate with another hermaphrodite in the 69 position. <laughs> Sexually mature worms like me have a clitellum, a kind of a muff that I can slide along my body. First, I push to tell them to collect my eggs. Then, to collect my partner's sperm. Then, I slip it over my head and drop it to the ground. My little worms will be born in two to three weeks. <laughs> Enjoyed that. I would, yeah. you know, the slug is pretty, pretty racy, kind of cold, praying mantis, really fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's done so, a ton. So that large segment moves? Yeah, it's so, not a segment, it's actually kind of like a covering that will move down and it picks up the eggs and then it moves down to the segment that collects the sperm. Yeah. Do you ever find the, the cup, the, that segment? After this well, what happens after it's, and I think I have a picture of it here. See, um, that's what actually forms the egg cocoon. Wow. Is that? No, I don't, I don't have the picture here. So after it like comes off, it has the fertilized eggs in it um, and, and forms the oops, cocoon that holds the eggs inside. You say cocoon is it silk? No, it's. You know, it's a kind of it's, it's yeah. Yes, yeah. All right. Let's talk about that. Have people read There's a Hair in My Dirt by Gary Larson? <laughs> <laughs> I highly recommend that. Say uh, um, it again. There's a Hair in My Dirt. It has a great ecological message, too. But there's this whole thing, you know, it's a family of earthworms, and 
and here she says, kissing out of your species is not really recommended, son, but if you have to, always choose a gastropod over an amphibian. <laughs> Bernie Johnson, Mother Worm suddenly blurted out, what, Father Worm asked, finding a story interrupted for the second time. Bernie Johnson, his wife repeated. I went to my high school prom with a slug named Ernie Johnson, and Ernie Sly might have been harmless, dear, but it certainly wrecked my evening. Before the night was over, I was wishing I had brought my soul chicken. <laughs> It's a cute book. I, I would recommend it. So that's sort of the end of the lecture portion at this point. And what I want to do um, before we stop all together, although we can have the lights right now, has a few common spiders. So from the back to the front, it's leaf litter safari. From the front to the back, it's the spiders. <coughs> so what your homework assignment is, is to take this book, which actually shows you a lot of the things that you might find, and you might find other things like that. And in the next week, I want you to find at least one something, okay? And when you find that one something, I want you to send a picture to all of us um, with a little, one interesting little fact about it and how you might talk about it with kids. And those of you who are doing Cal Naturalist, if you're so inclined, you can also um, submit it to iNaturalist. But I will be checking that listserv, and I might be sending a few things myself. But I thought that this might be a good way to get some field time um, with some of the stuff that we just talked about. Um, I, you know, get together with friends, go for a hike, just get out there. Get out there and be outside and look at this stuff a little bit. Um, I think most of what I talked about in terms of spiders and the different kinds of spider silk and their eyes and